ESC rejected, um, you know, automatically disqualified for language or any sort of issue like that. We have started offering developmental or scientific editing, um, which is um, newer for us and also, um, you know, just a different type of editing style, um, but that's been really um, beneficial for researchers as well. And then the biggest sort of business development is our preprint platform. So Research Square, um, we're actually going through a little brand refresh, I guess you could say, um, because our preprint platform is actually named Research Square, um, mm -hmm. which gets a little confusing with our employer brand um, because you know a lot of our editors aren't really working on that platform. They're working on AJE editing submissions. So we're going to try to clear that up in the very near future in terms of brand um, identity. But uh, the preprint platform, for those of you that aren't familiar um, with that or that, you know, the concept maybe in general, but basically researchers um, can opt in through um, our partner Springer Nature and all of their journals to have their paper posted pre-publication um, and to get feedback to, um, you know, just basically create a conversation around the research that is coming out and uh, make it a lot more um, accessible to a larger audience. Um, we're running into some challenges there. Um, you know, obviously this is a newer product. This is even newer in terms of publish publishing industry standards. So um, there's a learning curve there and we're kind of finding out what we need in terms of roles and hiring um, as we go. But we're having a lot more, you know, product management um, and those types of roles come about because of it. Um, a lot of what's going on there. Um, I don't want to keep babbling. I'd like to, you know, make sure uh, everybody gets their questions answered. Um, that's the most important thing to me. So I'd love to, you know, hear what, what people are most interested in and I can kind of go there. So if it's okay with you, Jessica, I thought we'd kind of start with the standard questions. We yep. also had some questions come in over registration that I shared with you. Yep. And then that'll give folks a chance to post some questions in the chat or formulate their questions and, and jump in um, in a few minutes. So you've done a great job already addressing um, a lot of information about Research Square. Can you tell us a little bit about a, a typical day for a PhD level hire at Research Square? Definitely. So we, um, you know, our PhDs are mostly come, you know, into Research Square uh, via our editing roles. So our academic editor role and our developmental editor role, which um, are on our job board. And what that looks like um, is, you know, you're editing. <laughs> so um, there are other ways, you know, um, you know, to get involved. But like I said, most people, um, you know, when they start out at Research Square are starting out as editors. Um, and what that looks like um, is, you know, there are, there are deadlines, there are, um, you know, certain targets to hit, certain quality standards, obviously. Um, but we have a very rigorous training program. We've, um, since I would say um, 2017, have really ramped up the number of editors that we're bringing in-house versus contractor editors. Um, and for that reason, we've kind of established a pretty um, extensive training program. So if you've never edited, that's not really unusual um, actually for, you know, editing uh, experience is definitely a bonus, is a plus. And that's why um, if someone doesn't seem like the right fit um, or they don't know if editing is right for them right now, we often suggest they try contracting. Um, and that's also why I shared that link here. But you don't necessarily need to have editing experience um, or if you've had editing experience in your own lab or, you know, just in a more informal kind of way, um, we totally take that into consideration. For us, I would say, you know, the most important thing is a, um, a desire to learn. Uh, we, we use Strengths Finder, or I guess it's now Clifton Strengths 
I don't know, again, rebranding everywhere. <laughs> so they, we use that um, as a developmental tool at Research Square and we found that uh, achiever and learner are, are pretty much our two highest ranking strengths. Um, and that has a lot to do with a lot of the PhDs that we hire. Um, that's just a sort of uh, innate trait for a lot of folks that <laughs> decide to take on a PhD. Um, so I would say editing, a lot of our editors go on to become managers. All of our team managers on the editing teams are developed in-house. We have an in-house leadership training program. Um, we have um, a lot of developmental opportunities. Um, we're hiring a lot of data analysts right now. So um, anybody that's, you know, interested in data would have, you know, a lot of options. We are doing a lot of automation. Um, so if there's any interest in machine learning or um, automation or engineering, that um, is ways that you can, you know, diversify the work. But I would say, I gotta be, you know, honest about it and say you're editing, you know, you're, you're reading papers, um, you're, you know, expected to reach a target um, however, how you reach that target, when you work, where you work, everything is um, flexible. And we were remote first um, before COVID. And so we haven't had to learn how to be a remote company. We, we've been one for a number of years. Um, we do have a great office in Durham that is closed indefinitely, but um, we we definitely know how to work as a team remotely and you know we use slack a lot for um, communication and really the only expectations in terms of how you structure your time would be meeting deadlines and then if you had meetings with your team or your manager or something like that but the rest is super flexible um I know I, I go off on tangents that answer other questions. I'm that's, so proud. That's okay. That's great. <laughs> so you've been talking about all the hiring that you're doing. You're talking about folks with a PhD generally are in editor level position. So talk to us a little bit about how you consider hiring um, materials um, in the process like CV, cover letter, resume. Um, do people need to show that they've had publications in order to be considered for those editing roles? How does, how does that figure in? So what's... For our academic editor role, we a PhD is preferred, but um, uh, the master's is the requirement, um, and that can be an MS, um, an MA, maybe if we have a need. Uh, we usually are hiring in the the hard sciences, mostly, um, sometimes life sci, and very rarely humanities, which is my background. I always feel so bad, <laughs> but um, we. So I, you know, I, I used to do application screening for all of the editor roles. Um, the developmental editor role, the PhD is required. And I'm going to speak about them separately because they're kind of evaluated differently because of the different styles of editing and what it requires. So for academic editor, um, you, we basically are looking for someone who meets the base criteria of having an advanced degree in the field in which we're looking to hire. So when it says academic editor in whatever field, you know, we actually, we, we do try to stick pretty closely to what is listed in that posting. Um, because that's, you know, what papers we're getting in that we can't, you know, edit in house. So we look to make sure that the area of study or AOS um, is aligned. Uh, and we look to make sure that there is an advanced degree. We look to ensure that the individual is uh, eligible to work in the United States. Um, unfortunately, at this present moment, um, we, we are a US-based um, uh, employer and, and don't have the ability to um, offer ex or extend work visas. Um, however, we do, we just are announcing a, um, a stronger partnership with Springer Nature, which is a global company. And we already, through our partnership with them, 
do have some people working in London. We have some employees in China. Um, but for these editing roles, they would have to be, um, we would check to make sure that the individual is eligible to work in the US because that is a restriction for this role. And, um, and then for cover letter, um, there's also always a question on our applications. And this is like a little bit of a peek behind the curtain. But <laughs> there's a what makes you unique question, which most people probably look at and um, are either annoyed by it <laughs> or they're like, nobody really reads this. This is, you know, why am I doing this? But it actually is one of those things that um, we look at and, and take into consideration, not a, a ton, but it, it definitely gives us a sense of the person. And the reason that it's so important for us to get that, um, you know, that sort of personal touch is because we are not just looking for the right uh, role fit, like technically speaking, we're looking for a person that can really embrace our core values um, and can really understand and work within our culture and environment because, um, you know, flexibility. So, you know, I think a lot of people love it as a concept, but then maybe, um, you know, being accountable and, and having to have your own sort of personal level of responsibility sometimes isn't, you know, um, the way you're most effective or something like that. So we, we try to get um, a sense through the cover letter, through that what makes a unique statement, um, you know, a sense of if this person would embrace and fuel change, which is like one of our core values or um, enable the success of others. You know, if they, if this is an individual that, um, you know, writes in their what makes you unique, like, you know, that they don't like working on teams or something, or, you know, I, I can do anything by myself. Like that, you know, for us would probably be something that we would say, you know, that might not be the, the right fit for our team. And, and uh, we don't judge harshly, you know, on those things. Um, we, we definitely strive to um, meet as many candidates as we can. The, the interesting thing about this role um, and for the developmental editor role is that we do have editing exercises that candidates have to complete um, after resume review. So it's a short sample edit exercise, but it, it allows us to um, see editing potential or editing capability in individuals that don't have editing experience, let's say. You know, if there's somebody that has years and years and years of editing experience, um, you know, if we looked at their resume, we'd probably be like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. But we've hired many people out of labs, out of postdocs, out of, right out of school that have no editing experience and with our training can be super successful. So that's why we have those editing exercises. And then after that, um, if you pass the editing exercise, it is um, a quick 30 minute interview with one of our hiring managers. Um, and that's mostly just to answer any questions you might have about the role. We send an information sheet um, that, you know, tells the candidate a bit more about the role. And um, so that first interview is, you know, mostly just to um, get to know the candidate better. And then there is a two part final interview where the candidate meets two peers. So two people that are currently performing that role and then they meet two managers um, that are editing team managers. Um, so the peer, um, we call it peer info session a lot of times because it's not, it doesn't really serve as an interview. There's not like a interview questions. It's, it's more so like an opportunity for the candidate to learn more about the day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, not a lot of candidates have um, folks setting up lovely Zoom calls like this to answer a lot of these questions up front. So that peer info session is designed to act as a sort of informal way of getting to know um, more about our business. And yeah, and then from there, you know, reference check offer the sort of standard. Um, but we 
you know, when we are hiring for roles that are open immediately, you know, we, we have a very quick process. Um, and I personally have set the goal within recruitment to speak to candidates, um, you know, as frequently as needed, but not letting a candidate go without, you know, go longer than two weeks without hearing from us. So, um, you know, we, we really do try to, um, respect the candidate and the candidate's time in this process. And, um, because we've been hiring academic editors steadily for a while now, we have a really good sense of, of, of what we're looking for and what will work. And, you know, that allows time to not be wasted on either side. Um, and I will say for the developmental editor role, you know, we are looking for a little bit more editing experience there, or at least, um, publications are, you know, viewed a little bit more, um, or, or taken into consideration more for that role. And that's only because that style of editing requires, um, a grasp of, of the scientific knowledge in those papers. Um, versus um, a knowledge of, you know, a basic English language um, structure in a scientific paper. So it's just a different, um, a much more intensive style of editing that requires a little bit more of that research um, experience. Great, thank you. Well, I think kind of wrapped up in that answer, you've addressed um, quite a number of the questions in terms of, you know, what other kinds of skills are you looking for? Um, what can people who are looking to, to build a career in this field do to prepare? Um, but let me ask you kind of a pointed question that is, you know, is it helpful for um, graduate students and postdocs to volunteer to do some editing work on a paper for their lab or their research group? You know, what kinds of editing experiences count as editing experience when you talk about years of experience? So, um, Yes, we, you know, if, if you have helped, um, you know, edit papers in an informal way that you're, you know, you're not really sure how to address that, you know, I would say, put that in the cover letter. Um, that is, yeah, it is, it is sort of challenging to um, work that in sometimes to a, a resume or CV. Um, the other types of experience, you know, there are depending on your field, um, there are a lot of contractor opportunities, not just at AJE, but at um, other uh, publishers or publishing service companies. And so that's a way to um, gain experience. I know that there are, um, you know, courses uh, and, you know, webinar type stuff about language editing specifically. Um, and I can ask one of our team managers about where, where to find that information. But I would say any um, exposure to writing from a non-native English speaker that you then help edit and, and you get some familiarity with that style of editing mm -hmm. um, is, is super helpful. And I think our contractor opportunities obviously give you a glimpse into, you know, what we look for um, when we're editing, you know, the contractors, um, you know, don't receive feedback or anything like that, but they receive a lot of resources on how to edit like an AJE editor and all of that stuff. So uh, a lot of times we say the contractor is, you know, really great because you can get access to the resources. Um, and then if you are really passionate about it, if um, it's something you find that you're really interested in and want to do full time, then um, it's a lot easier of a transition. And we still have that training to like, you know, really get uh, people on board in the right way. Thank you. So for folks who are with us on the call, I have one more question that I think Jessica hasn't answered. Um, for the registration questions, and then um, it'll be your turn to pitch in some questions over chat or to um, unmute yourself and ask. So Jessica, one other question. Um, does Research Square allow or encourage employees to continue academic publish in their, publishing in their own research areas once they start working for Research Square? Um, I would say 
there's no stopping you from doing that. Uh, we do have a, a small professional development stipend. Um, it's $150 for the year. I've used that on going to um, art history conferences um, and presenting my work um, at, at those things, which is not related to my role um, specifically, obviously. Um, I wish it was, that'd be cool, like recruiter, art historian. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's very much an individual um, undertaking. There, we don't really um, have any sort of programs or anything like that in support of, of publishing. We do um, have other professional development um, that could be, you know, helpful for, for that purpose. Like we, um, we offer certifications like the Bells certification, um, which is a life science editing certification. Um, and so ways to develop in the scientific or research field that may not necessarily be publishing your own papers, but other, other opportunities for sure. I definitely know our employees have published um, while being employees, so it's not... Um, it's not not a thing. <laughs> it's just uh, we don't necessarily have um, any sort of uh, programs or policies are around like what we expect there. Great. Thank you. It's very helpful. So um, at this point, you've got about three minutes remaining in the call, and I want to make sure that folks who have joined us have a chance to ask their questions. Um, so do we have some questions from the folks who are with us today? I do. Uh, sorry. Uh, hi, Jess or Jessica. Hi. Um, I was just curious uh, what like the like sort of the management between like the team editor managers or editor team managers and then the actual editors, what that sort of feedback or relationship looks like um, at Research Square or AJ. Yeah, no, that's great. So um, when we hire editors, we hire um, into specific teams um, of editors that are, it, it used to be just um, new hires and like training and onboarding folks, but now we've um, mixed it up where you, an editor would join a team uh, and it could be a number of established academic editors or AEs, if I keep saying that, that's what I'm referring to. <laughs> Lots of acronyms at Research Square. That's like the biggest learning curve. <laughs> um, but the AEs uh, are on team sizes that are, I would say, anywhere from like five to 12 people. Um, and the managers are, I'm going to think right now and, and wonder if there's anybody that's an exception to the rule. But all of those team managers have been editors themselves um, prior to. So, um, there is a lot for our editing roles, a lot of training and onboarding materials, like ready to go, um, you know, kind of vetted for uh, their actual um, usefulness uh, to the new hire. So there's, I guess a lot of, you know, the first three months are, you know, pretty outlined um, for any manager. And that includes feedback. So feedback is given at 60 days, 90 days. Um, and then we're kind of just one of those continuous feedback type places where um, we think it's better to um, just approach um, any sort of feedback quickly. And um, obviously in the spirit of our core values. So, um, you know, not um, basically assuming positive intent and approaching all feedback from that point of view. Um, and then uh, in terms of the teams, you know, how often people change teams or, you know, I would say it depends on what you um, end up being really good at or what you really like to do in terms of editing. We have an entire team that's dedicated just to tools. 
um, like coming up with editing tools and macros and all that crazy stuff. Um, and so people move on to that team if that's what they're into and that's what they have some demonstrated ability in. Um, and then we have other people that might go the customer service route that might want to um, explore helping researchers with their papers from that point of view. Um, and so basically, you know, the, the managers are um, I, I, all great. I can't, like, I'm like, we, uh, I would say in our uh, exit interview feedback, the, the one thing that is, oh, like the most positive reviews are always about relationship to the manager. So that's why I don't have much to say about it. We're not, <laughs> we kind of have um, just a really great culture where um, there's not a lot of ego. And so m a lot of our managers um, have high emotional intelligence, extremely empathetic. And um, so that I think creates a very um, collegial and um, open friendly kind of environment. Great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Well, thank you for that really thorough and comprehensive answer, Jessica. Um, that does bring us up to 1.31. I'll do a, a quick scan to see if anyone else has a burning question, quick question before we... And I'm happy this. to answer any questions. Like if any of you want to email me, um, you know, Melissa can share my email or I can share my email. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, we are participating as an employer in the North Carolina Masters and PhD Career Fair. I don't know, Duke is usually a part of all that. So yes. we'll, be, we'll be at that, um, which is you know, in a couple months. But you know, if you have questions, you can catch me there. Um, but yeah, I, thank you so much for, for inviting me and for taking the time to listen to me talk a lot. <laughs> Yeah, this is terrific. And we know um, lots and lots of Duke PhD alumni and postdoc alumni um, find uh, both contractor roles and full-time employment roles with Research Square. And so that's been a wonderful way that folks um, either find a career that is really fulfilling or helps them launch into um, a different field altogether. Uh, building yeah. those communication and editing skills can help launch them to to other things too. So Jessica, thank you so much. Please join me in a virtual round of applause for Jessica Keo. <laughs> and thanks to everyone for joining us today and asking your questions. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jess.